Bom dia. Bonjour. Tá bom. Hey y'all! Hello! Welcome in! Hello! Welcome to Solid Ground. Hey y'all, welcome to Solid Ground. What's up y'all? Welcome to Solid Ground. Woo! Where we meet up once a week to learn about God's Word and encourage one another. To learn about God's Word and encouraging one another. And where you are always welcome to join and express yourself and feel like you're part of a family. Be a part of the big family. And feel like you're part of the family. And feel like you're part of a giant family. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. And don't forget to mask up and stay safe. Give me the thumbs up. <clears throat> okay, so welcome again, everyone, all of those who are here digital, and all of those who will be watching in the future digitally. Um, thank you guys for joining us for another solid ground. Um, so uh, this week we're going to be getting into it's kind of a so this is like a broad kind of principle topic it's not really like a um, it's not like a really like we're going in like super detailed fine detail we're kind of looking at how does this principle apply when we're looking at the entirety of the bible when we're evaluating anything that comes to understanding the word so there's a lot that could be on here this verse sheet could probably be like 10 times bigger than the verse sheet that is here um, and there's so many different aspects of this subject matter that it could be a whole series. We could do a whole series on just what it all encompasses the matter of like having a vision or seeing something in the word. Because um, it's, it's just so broad in the, in the Bible. Um, but anyway, we're just going to dig in to this distinction between knowledge versus vision. Um, so can anyone give me like a definition of knowledge? Just define knowledge. You guys, you guys can, you guys can shout out too because like we can hear you. Things you know. <laughs> You're not technically supposed to use the word in the defining of the word. Not Miriam. Information <laughs> over time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can someone give a, a, a definition of like vision? Basic, rudimentary. What comes in your eye holes? <laughs> we'll take it we'll take it perception visual perception well, preferential so when we dig in perception of light just so i know what my timing is like um so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at the danger of knowledge so actually knowledge on the one hand i think that we highly value it because we live in a society that values knowledge and understanding and for good measure you it's probably good to understand how things work in your daily life to be able to exist as a human being uh, you're all in college, so if I was out here saying that knowledge is terrible, then you would all probably want to quit college, so that's not the goal of this, um, but when it comes to biblical understanding and biblical knowledge, we need to understand that there's there's a kind of a different path. There's a kind of a danger uh, to the matter of uh, biblical knowledge, um, and so one of the first things, let's go ahead and read the first verse. So Alex, do you want to start us off? Yeah, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. So this is, this is we're going all the way back to the beginning. So if you want to understand a, a biblical principle, you can find many of the principles at the very beginning of the Bible. Um, everything that you see in Genesis, it sets the stage for really the rest of the Bible. So what is the matter of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, if you guys remember, maybe you know, maybe you don't know. In the beginning of the Bible, God created two trees. One tree was called the tree of knowledge no apples well the Life. first tree, the, the, yeah, the tree of life sorry there, there's there's the, the first tree that i want to hit on was there's a tree of life pomegranate um and the tree of life corresponded to the life of god so it wasn't just random life it wasn't just some weird artsy name it really corresponded to god himself um and then you go there's another tree that they were told not to eat of and that was the tree of the knowledge of oh, good meat a good and evil. Nice. Okay, so we hear that a lot. But so when I, when I was growing up, I heard those expressions a lot. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it just, all I knew was that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil basically just represented the life of Satan. It represented what caused man to fall. And so I never thought about it beyond just, it's the, it's the bad tree. But when you consider it, what is, what, what is it called? It is the tree of the knowledge. It's a complicated tree. It's got three, three layers to it. It's the tree of the knowledge, so it's an understanding of good and evil. 
So evil is on that tree. Good and evil are both on the same tree. That represents the tree that caused man to fall. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we think of that tree as it is purely evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's just evil. We, we overlook the good on there and we overlook the knowledge. We're just like, oh, it's just a tree of evil. No, that tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to understand there's a principle that's already being established at the beginning of the Bible. What caused man to take on a sinful nature? It was a tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. um, so that is that is something that we have to understand. That's in us. Um, we're still in the fall for following the following the word. Um, so then let's go to Second Corinthians three six. Brandon, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit. The letter kills the spirit gives life okay so obviously the word the bible is inspired by the by the spirit it's inspired in spirit that they would speak these things the problem is though is that oftentimes uh many examples that we see throughout the word is that people use the knowledge of the word to kill other people um they use their knowledge of what is supposed to be good according to the bible and they use that and ultimately ends up causing someone to die it causes death and we're going to see some examples of that um and so what we're seeing in the, is a principle in the New Testament that you can have the word, but you can mishandle the word in such a way that it causes you to kill someone. Maybe not physically. There are examples of physically killing people in the Bible uh, from having a knowledge. But you may also just kill their appreciation of the Lord. You know what I mean? I, it's like maybe I, you, you know, Alex, you come and you quote a verse to me, but you quoted it wrong. And I'm like, that's so dumb. It, the verse is this. Don't you know the verse is this, Alex? How could you get it wrong? And now Alex is like disappointed with his Christian life because he's like, oh man, I can't believe, you know, he's having a hard time enjoying the Lord now because now he feels bad because he misquoted a verse. But I'm the big jerk because I just killed his enjoyment of the Lord. I brought in death to the situation. I killed the life that he was experiencing from those verses. So anyway, we have to understand that there's something that supplies life in these verses and we can mishandle the word in a way to kill people. Um, yeah, there's no lack of historical examples of that. Um, so can we go to John 5 39? You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Okay, so this was an example. Just this is Jesus himself, and he's speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. They are the, these are the most educated of the Old Testament of, of this time. They are the scholars, um, they're the Jewish scholars. They know more about the word than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And what he's trying to say to them is. You are searching the scriptures thinking that you, as you see, you, you think that you have eternal life. You think that by digging into these words that you're going to find eternal life. But these words testify concerning me. Mm. He was speaking of himself, you know, of, of his person. These words Moses wrote concerning me. That's literally what he said. If you read the law, which is also mind-blowing, where does Moses talk about Jesus in the Old Testament? It's, it's everywhere, but it's hard to see. When you, when you look at it, you're like, where's Jesus and all of this? But yet Jesus is saying that Moses wrote concerning me. So where is this coming from? Well, mm -hmm. we have to understand again that the word should be a director. It should lead us to the person of Christ. It shouldn't lead us to merely having knowledge. If we're just seeking knowledge, then actually we miss the person. Mm -hmm. um, and it can lead to misusing the word. <laughs> um, so then let's go to our first example here, which is Acts 26, 9, 10, 11. So. Abigail, if you got that one. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. You want me to read all three? Yeah, go ahead. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So here's another thing that's really interesting. When we trace this back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what did God say will happen if the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It's in the verse. So, you know, you, will surely die. you shall surely die. So death is the result mm -hmm. of relying on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is inevitable because, of course, they didn't physically die. They didn't like Adam and Eve didn't eat of the, the fruit and then they like just comped out and God dug a grave for them. No, there was a death that happened, but it was a kind of a spiritual death. They were cut off from their fellowship with God. And so, but what we see is actually the use of knowledge 
um, it, it can, in fact, kill. This is the testimony of Paul. Acts 26, 9 is Paul giving account of his own testimony. What, what was he doing before he became Paul? Well, this is Saul, really. You know, if you want to get like, super technical, don't kill me with the word. Um, but if you want to get super technical with the word, he was Saul in this situation before he was converted. Um, and he was also educated. He gives an account. Is it, uh, mm -hmm. it's here actually, it's in Acts. Mm -hmm. He gives an account of his education. And he was like the educated of the educated. Like mm -hmm. he went to Harvard Business School or Harvard Law. Mm -hmm. And he learned from the highest professor, tenured professor, professor at Harvard Law, who's defined law. That is the equivalent of Paul's education. And look at this, look at these verses. What, how he recounts this in his own mind. I myself was convinced. Where is that? That's knowledge. I was convinced. He had knowledge, and that knowledge convinced him of something. Yeah. Um, to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, and, and then another one is, if you see this, it gets, it gets pretty bad. Because it actually says that he was there when Stephen was stoned. He collected the garments. So well, when Stephen is testifying to the Jews, they hated what he, what he was saying so much that they cast stone. They killed him. And it says that they put his garments, the garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Saul totally approved of this thing that was going on, the killing, the stoning of Stephen. Mm -hmm. And not only that, he says, um, I cast my vote against them when they were put up for, when they were put to death. So he approved of the death of Christians before he was converted. He was fine with it. And this was all because he was convinced. Mm -hmm. He was someone who understood the Old Testament law. He knew the status of the Jews as being God's chosen people. And he was convinced that the people who followed Jesus of Nazareth, the Christians, which by the way, Christians, the first use of that term was actually derogatory. It wasn't meant to be like, oh, we're Christians. How great is that, guys? No, they were like, ugh, Christians. Mm -hmm. Those Christians over there. Um, that, was, that was the condition that Paul perceived the believers in the early days before he was converted. And again, just to point this out, the result of that was death. Mm -hmm. It literally caused death. He would go looking for people in the streets. He would gather them out of their homes. This is like very like Nazi-esque things that he was doing. Um, so anyway, that's just one example. There's plenty of examples. If you look at Cain and Abel, that's an example of knowledge. Moses killing the, the slave before he goes off into the wilderness, that's an example of knowledge. He, he was doing something that he thought was good in his own mind. And that's with all of these examples. Um, <clears throat> so let's go to... Uh, Matthew twenty two thirty five. 35. You can read all those verses too. It's fine. Just for time. Okay. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends all the law and the prophets. So the reason I put this on here was because actually this is a section in the word. I didn't want to put the whole section, but if you want to go back and read Matthew 22, a bunch of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and this one was a lawyer, they were asking them questions. They were asking Jesus questions about the Bible, about his understanding of the word, to try and trip him up. They were doing whatever they could to trip him up. And what you notice is that every answer that he gave was totally not in their consciousness mm -hmm. of being the right answer. And yet it was a better answer than any of them probably could have ever thought of. In fact, every time he gave them an answer, they said that what you say is good. They were like silent. They had nothing. <laughs> they had nothing that they could say in response. So what we see here is that Jesus himself wasn't on the plane of knowledge. He wasn't playing in their game. He wasn't playing in their their field of understanding. They were all over knowledge, mm -hmm. and in fact, they were looking for any reason to accuse him, to to get rid of him as a legitimate person. Um, they're trying to in today's terms. They're trying to deplatform. They're trying to cancel Jesus. Like, let's get him to say something wrong. Sure, yeah. If we get him to, if we get him to blaspheme, then we can get him off, out, off the public stage. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to listen to him. And every answer he gave, they like, he blew them away. They were like, what, how? Really, they were, actually, they asked, I can't remember where it is, but they, they said, uh, at one point, I think it's in Luke, they say, is this not the son? Is this not the, the, the man from Nazareth? Which Nazareth is like, I mean, not to throw anyone under the bus who might be from Pine Bluff, but it's like, it's like if some guy was a farmer from Pine Bluff and just like comes out and is like answering things that the scholars don't even understand, we'd be like, is this guy not from Pine Bluff? 
what is this? How does he know this? And he was a carpenter. He didn't go to these educated schools of these, these Pharisees and Sadducees. Um, and yet this was how he was answering them. So we see that even, even Jesus's understanding of the word wasn't based on this matter of just knowledge. Because if it was just based on knowledge, he would have answered it exactly the way they thought he was going to answer it. Mm -hmm. um, so then let's go to John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the reality and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this is a little bit of a transition to the next section. Um, the distinction between the matter of simply having knowledge and simply having and having something that's a vision. Um, and there's probably a better way to, to get into this, but this word actually, uh, you've probably heard it translated, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But this Greek word is um, aletheia. And aletheia implies like the true state of something. It's not just like true. It's like the real state of a thing. Um, and so that's why you can translate this. Or it gives you a better picture if you look at the, the matter of reality. So if, can anyone off the top of their head give me an idea of like, and you guys can do it too. I see you guys muted. I'll call you out. I don't care. Um, what's the difference between something that is true and something that's real reality? Why would that be? Why would there be a distinction? Is there like an overlap? Is there a distinction between truth and reality? Well, truth can be determined by the masses oftentimes. Yeah. Whereas reality is not based on popular vote. It just yeah. is. Reality is objective. Truth can be arguably subjective. Yeah. And it also incorporates a matter of like time. <laughs> yeah, they're both they're both true because the public can decide what they believe is true as a group, but it doesn't mean that it's true. They just yeah. have decided that it is true. Mm -hmm. It also incorporates a matter of time. There's a time element. So it would be true for me to say that Alex is wearing a white shirt right now. That is truth. Um, but that truth may change when he goes home and he changes his shirt. So it's true for now, but it's not going to be true later when he goes home and changes his shirt. Mm -hmm. Um, so what reality is, reality is an objective truth that is true all the time. It is always true. It cannot be untrue. It is the, re it is the real state of mm -hmm. what is going on. Um, you can't refute it. It's like if you look at it and you try to refute it, you're literally just being an ostrich and hiding your head on the ground. Like you cannot refute that this is real. Um, and so what Christ is saying when he said, I am the way the reality in the life, instead of just truth, he's saying that when you touch me, you touch that which is always true, that can never not be true. So that is a knowledge that's way better than just knowledge, in my opinion. If you touch something that is like the real state of things, and that's Christ, that's way better than just knowledge, because knowledge changes. I mean, that's every, we, we find out new stuff all the time, um, and we were frequently wrong about many things. <laughs> um, so then we're going to go into uh, the next section, which is the governing vision. I'm going to start getting into vision. So are you next? Okay, Job 42, 5 and 6. And 6. Oh, sorry. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So you guys might recognize this from last week because <clears throat> Brandon had this one on there. But, but this is the classic verse of the distinction between having a knowledge of something and seeing something. Um, Job was count, was considered the most righteous man on the earth at the time. Um, and like Brandon was saying, he was making offerings before the offerings were even a thing. The offerings hadn't even been given to Moses. And Job was so righteous that he figured out, I, I need to do something to make sure my kids are like, okay, in the eyes of God. So I should make offerings. How righteous is that? He's a pre, he's a future, like precognitive righteous. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like another level of righteous. Um, and in fact, he's, I, I, I saw this recently. Uh, God says that uh, Job was accounted as one of the righteous people when he's talking to Ezekiel. Mm. So it's even throughout the Bible, Job was considered a very righteous man. Mm. So he knew something of Jehovah at this time. Uh, but after this entire chapter goes down, finally God appears to Job and he says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. And that, and then he was a righteous man. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. And what is his response? Therefore, I despise myself because he realizes who God is and he realizes who he is. He thought he was righteous and even God called him righteous. But from God's perspective, from the real, from the real condition of what's, what was going on, he said, therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Um, so this is one of the, the bigger differences in terms of 
uh, when we really see something, there is a change. It, there's something, something changes in us. Um, we can't go about doing things the same way that we were. Um, I'm trying to think whether I want to explain why I had you guys do your exercise now or after we get into Paul's experience, but um, they, they did some things. So um, ask them when they, when they're, when we're done, ask them like what they did. Um, so how about, how about, yeah, let's, um, okay, I'll explain. So, so, okay. What did you guys notice between the first time you did, you, you did the exercise and then the time that you went back and you took the blindfold off? It was a lot easier without the blindfold. A lot easier, a lot easier. And well, you took the same way, but did the rest of you try and go the same way? <laughs> yep. I, I noticed, you guys might not have noticed it, but actually you guys went one way at first when you had the blindfold on and then you went the other way. But then when you took the blindfold off, you didn't go back the same way. You saw that there was an obstruction there, so you just went the other way. So it was much easier. You didn't have to run into the obstruction and realize and even you, actually, to some degree, you, you, uh, you could clear that obstacle much easier. You knew that there was an obstacle, but you knew how to navigate the obstacle because you could see the, where the dimensions of this oval was. So even though you went the same way, you navigated it way better. So why did we do that example? Well, in the matter of vision, really the principle of when you see a vision, when you see something in the word, the result is, is that you cannot keep doing things the way that you were doing them. It's impossible to keep doing them the way that you were doing them. The moment that blindfold was removed and you had vision, you did not do it the same way that you did it before. Mm -hmm. um, you were able to navigate that situation much better. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to this matter of vision, and there are many things that we, we kind of, the Lord needs to progressively develop a vision within us. Um, this matter of vision is once we see something, it changes. We cannot respond the same way that we were. I cannot be the same person. If I see reality, if I know that the, there's a real state of something, I cannot go back to believing that it is something that it's not. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so this is why having a vision to govern our Christian life is so important. Because if you merely have knowledge, your knowledge can be wrong. Your knowledge can be used to kill people. Uh, your knowledge could change over time because you were wrong. But if you have a vision, you can't go back. That's it. You're done. Um, some people like to use the expression, you're wrecked. You know, your whole life course has taken a shift. I cannot keep going the way I was going. And it's not even because you're willing yourself to. That's the thing. When you see your vision, it's not like, you know, it's not like I'm going to will myself to, to, to do this thing differently. You just literally cannot do it differently. You see it now. Um, you could run into that sofa if you wanted to, but why would you run into the sofa? You know what I mean? You can see that there's a sofa there. Let me do something else. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the central principle of the matter of vision. Mm -hmm. um, but let's go ahead and read like what was Paul's experience. So Acts 26, 14, he can read uh, half of them. You can leave the rest to Alex if you want. All right. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying in me, in the Hebrew language, a soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those 
who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. <clears throat> okay, so this Paul's whole account of when he was <clears throat> saved, we could have another like two solid grounds probably just dissecting everything that happens here, how significant these things are, all the events that shape Paul's ministry clearly throughout the rest of the word. But what I want to point out here is this is this is the defining moment. This is what changed Paul. He went from Saul, who was collecting the garments, voting to kill people, and totally down for it, looking, wandering the streets to drag people out of their homes. Um, and then he has a vision. He sees Christ. Christ appears to him. Um, and this is the whole, this, this is a whole interaction that happens. I want you guys to look through it and point out anything that you think represents vision. Just shout it out there. And maybe underline if you've got a pen or something. It can be pretty loose. I'll start you off. For I have appeared to you. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with vision, I literally have to see something, right? And there are a lot of words that are synonymous with vision. Hint, 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 hint. Heard a voice. Heard a voice is part of it, yeah. Witness. Witness. Interesting. Heavenly vision. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom appeared. There's there's a, a number in 18. Mm -hmm. Darkness to light. Boom, darkness to light. It's hard to see if you're in darkness, right? Open eyes. To open their eyes. That's right. It's really hard to see something if your eyes are closed. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried to see something when your eyes were closed, but it's pretty hard. <laughs> and also in 16, you can see. Yes. So if you notice what was what was his what was Christ, what was Jesus' commission to him? He said, I have appeared to you. He didn't say I came to you with words. I didn't he didn't say I came to convince you. Um, let me send someone. Well, he had he did it, he sent someone to Paul. So it's not like God, Jesus didn't have the means of sending someone to Paul to convince him. Send my best debater. I'm gonna send Peter was probably still cooking at this time, but he was probably your best bet. It's like, send Peter. Peter's going to go convince you, Paul, that you're choosing the wrong way. Um, that's not the Lord's way. The Lord appeared. He said, I have appeared to you. Um, and he says, for this purpose, to appoint you as a service and witness. This is, this is Paul's commission. I appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. So his whole thing was, his, he didn't say, Paul, I'm going to, uh, send you as a uh, as a researcher. I'm going to send you as one who knows something. He says, I'm sending you as a witness. You've seen me. You can testify to me, to who I am. And not only that, I'm going to keep appearing to you. He didn't say I'm going to keep teaching you. He said, I'm going to keep appearing to you um, so that you can continue to be a witness. Yeah. Um, and even his commission was to open their eyes. If, you, if you're being sent, if I send Brandon, like, let's say Brandon's not in the room, and I send him into the room. Before he goes in the room, I say, Brandon, I need you to go and open all their eyes. What does that imply? <laughs> what does it imply about the people who are in the room? Their eyes are closed. closed. Their eyes are closed. So if Paul sends, if, if his commission is to go and open their eyes, it implies that all of their eyes are closed. They cannot see something. Mm -hmm. How can you have a vision if your eyes aren't? And he needs to turn them from darkness to light, mm -hmm. which means you guys are in darkness already. Your condition is darkness. I need to bring you out of darkness into light. Um, and then that these things are also linked to the matter of the authority of Satan. To be in darkness and to be blind is to be in the authority of Satan. So, um, so this was Paul's commission. And this is what the Lord is doing with us progressively. Paul's ministry is what we have in the word. And what does the word do? Well, the word is turning us it's fulfilling paul's commission by being in the word it's turning us gradually none of us are none of us in the staff who are slightly older than you but none of us are going to say that our eyes are fully open you know we're, we're just totally we see everything you know we've, we've got we're just full of light you know we're totally not under the authority of darkness or the authority of satan 
No, but this is a progressive experience that the Lord needs to keep recovering us from or keep bringing us out of the condition that we're in. Um, so then just the, the next example, um, I'll read Galatians 1.1 1, 1, just because nice and quick. Then after 14 years, so by the way, I don't know if you realize this, but when, after, Paul was, after Paul was saved, he didn't just like go immediately to Jerusalem and he was like superpower Paul. Like that wasn't his ministry. He actually spent 14 years. He spent some time thinking about the things that had been said to him. Um, he chewed on it. Uh, he, yeah, he spent a lot of time considering this, which is not something that we do very often these days. But um, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up, and so I underline these, these for you just because, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm, I'm nice like that. Uh, I want to save you the effort. Uh, I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before parentheses, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. So why did Paul go? Paul went because he had revelation. Um, and so this is an interesting word. I just want to like touch on this really quickly. Sometimes we hear the word revelation, especially we hear like the last book of the Bible, and we have like it drums up certain concepts in our mind of like, oh, yeah, apocalypse, um, which is the actual Greek word is apocalypse, is where we get the word for revelation. Um, but what is the root word for revelation? Reveal. To reveal. That's all revelation is. It just means that you couldn't see something, and now you can see something. It's revealed. Oh, apocalypse. Oh, apocalypse means the, the removal of the veil. The taking away of the veil. So when you read the book Revelation, or no S, Revelation, one singular. Uh, when you read when you read the book Revelation, uh, the implication is what you're reading is a removal of the thing that kept you from seeing something. Mm -hmm. All you're reading about is, hey, look, suddenly the veil has been removed, and you can see it all now. Mm -hmm. um, that's the implication. It's not as scary as Apocalypse. We hear the word apocalypse in, in English and it carries a particular connotation. That's not what it means in the Greek. Um, it's a lot more soft than that, um, which is not to say the events in Revelation are not soft. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the point here though is that Paul, Paul, when he did something, when he moved forward in his ministry, he didn't do it because he thought it was a good idea. He didn't sit around going, you know, it would be a really good idea if I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas. That sounds like a great idea. He didn't convince himself that this was a good idea. He says it was because of revelation. So there was some spiritual shining inwardly that led him to go, hey, you know what? I see that the Lord is leading me to go to this place and I cannot not go. It's been revealed to me. What am I going to do? <laughs> so um, let's go ahead and get into our last section, the elements of receiving vision. And actually this is where we're going to do some experimentation. Yeah, I know. You guys are lucky. Maybe you should. It would be better if you guys are here because then I would use one of you as my my guinea pig. Yeah, I'd use Leslie. Don't shake your head. <laughs> You'd be my guinea pig for sure. Yeah, I was actually gonna grab uh Izzy, but you know, don't kill him with the word, but you know, make fun of him or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So turn this one off. So all right. Alex, you're going to be my, my guinea pig. Uh, dang it. So stand up. Uh, you've been picking on me all day. Yeah, I know. Well, look, if Izzy was here, so you got to take that up with Izzy. Yeah, yeah. take a heat for your boy. So we're going to blindfold you again over here. And hopefully this shows up okay for you guys. I don't know, maybe it won't. So uh, I'm going to lead you over. Watch out, there's a chair here. Stub your toe. This way, this way, this way. This way. Yeah, just stand like right there. And then could you be my assistant? Yes. Once you're kicking as hard as you can. I hope they'll be able to see it on the screen. Yeah, I can just see like... the wall right now. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to take that. And then I'm going to go. I'm going over here. Uh, no, I see everybody. I'm not really. Okay. So there's, wait, I can't talk. Are you sure it's a good idea to have someone blindfolded near fire? 
<laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm gonna call out to Alex. Alex, Alex, look at me. What's the first, assume that, I know it's like dim in here because we have these lights, but assume it's pitch black. You cannot, absolutely cannot see in this room at all. Totally pitch black. Not yet, not yet. So I call out to Alex and I say, Alex, look at me. What's the first thing he needs to deal with if he's gonna look at me? If he's gonna behold me, is it? Even if you remove it, there's still a problem, right? No, because it's pitch, <laughs> it's pitch black. It's pitch black in here. Even if you take your blindfold off, you still can't see anything, right? So if it's pitch black in the room, what's the first thing that we need to do? Yeah, yeah, no, no, totally answer. Yeah, this. Yeah, he 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 hears my voice, and he wants to look. I want him to look at me. And now we need to work through how is it how what do we need to do so that or what what has to happen to him so that he will be able to actually see me. Got to turn the lights yeah. on. So okay, so we turn the lights on. We're good to go. So I call again. I don't think he's gonna turn the lights on. Guys, watch. Ooh, wow. Ah. Okay, so so now the lights are on, and now I say, Alex, look at me. Now what's now what's the problem? Blindfolded. You're blindfolded. You gotta take that blindfold off. It's so, okay. Let's say your blindfold gets removed. Put that thing off. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so now obscure him. Obscure. <laughs> okay, Alex, look at me. So can you can you see me very well? You can kind of see me, right? I can see your red shirt. Yeah, you can see you can see like my form. I'm a human being who is here in the corner, right? Yeah. But you can't really see me. So what is obscuring his ability to see me? It's written there, so I know. Yes. It's sin. He still has sin in the way. So now let's say you confess. Right. You confess to the Lord. Yeah, yeah go for it. Okay, now I say. Alex, look at me. Boom, look at that. <laughs> Everything has been cleared up. Now he has every means that he needs to be able to see me. Um, but what were the things that he needed to do? Let's recap. The lights, he needed the lights, yeah. He needed to hear your voice first, actually. Yeah, well, he, he had to know that I was calling to him. So he had to hear that I was calling to him. So he did have to turn because he wasn't facing me, remember? So as soon as I said, Alex, look at me, he had to turn around. And then the next thing he had to do was, there was it was pitch black, so he needed the lights. And then he was blinded. He couldn't actually see anything. So he needed to have his blindness taken care of. And then after that, he still had something that was obscuring his ability to see me. Even though he could kind of see me, there was something that was just kind of in the way, and that was sin. And so the reason why we went through that is because in our experience, these are the things that cause us to that hinder our ability to see Christ. If Christ is the reality and Christ is the word, Christ is the reality in the word, who we should be looking for in the word is Christ, then it's really our whole Christian life is Christ being in a particular place and calling to us. Mm -hmm. It's like, look at me, just look at me. Don't worry about everything else, just look at me. Mm -hmm. But we have all these problems. <laughs> But the great thing is that according to the word, we know that the Lord has dealt with these problems. Um, and so in our experience, what we need to do is we need to turn our hearts. And so we're going to look at some of these verses. So we're just going to dig into these verses that kind of give us the tools to unlock the matter of seeing. So <clears throat> Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Okay, so the first thing we've got is in order to see, we need light. And what we see from this verse is that the word, the word is a lamp. The word is what illuminates. Um, lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How can we see? Well, we need the word. Um, that's pretty obvious. So let's go to Luke 4, 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So maybe you see a lot of parallels. Actually, this is in Isaiah. So Jesus is actually, he grabs a scroll in the Old Testament and he speaks it before a bunch of Jews. <clears throat> uh, oh, did you read 21? Can you read 21? 
And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This scripture of giving sight to the blind, proclaiming liberty to the captives, um, set liberty of those who are oppressed. If you notice, there was a lot of like conceptual similarities between this and what Paul was commissioned to do. So Jesus is going all the way back to Isaiah. He's quoting it and saying, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And then he converts Paul and he tells Paul to do the same thing. You continue what my commission was, which is to open the eyes of the blind. And of course, it's not Paul who's doing it. It's Christ operating through Paul to do these things. Um, so then again, here we go. The, we, needed to, we needed to have some light, so we got our light. We needed to have, uh, we needed to have our blinds. We needed to be unblinded. So the blind was removed. So we've got light. We've got, we're not blinded anymore. Um, and then let's read Luke 9.33. And as they were departing from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he was saying. And while he was saying these things, a cloud appeared and overshadowed them. And they became frightened as they entered into the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, the chosen one, hear him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they were, and they kept silent and reported to no one in those days anything of what they had seen. So probably I should have put this one as the first one, but um, so what we see is Peter, this is a crazy experience, but Peter sees Moses and Elijah and to not go into super in depth, but to just show you how rich the Bible is. Moses represents the law because he was the one who was given the law. And then Elijah represents the, the prophets because he was one of the prophets. And they're there ministering with Jesus. And Peter sees this. And Peter, being a good Jew, sees their father, Moses, the guy who brought the law. And he sees the most impressive, uh, the most impressive prophet probably in the history, in, at least in the things that he did. Um, and he's like, oh, Lord, it's a good thing I'm here. Moses, I see Moses is here. I see Elijah's here. I need to make tents for all three of you because I need to help you guys out. And then immediately it says, while he was still saying that, a voice from the heaven, Father come, the, the Father speaks and says, this is my son, hear him. Mm -hmm. Don't listen, like, sure, Elijah and Moses are there. What I need you to do is I need you to hear my son. Mm -hmm. That's who I need you to hear. Wow. Um, and then when they look again, they only see Jesus. Moses and Elijah are gone. So it's a clear statement to, to Peter and the Jews the person you need to listen to is Christ, hear him. And so now we've got our hearing. So Christ is speaking to us. He wants to speak something to us. We need to hear him. Um, so there's your turning, uh, which there are some other verses, but this is a good one. Um, and so then let's look at Ephesians 1, 17. Yeah, I think so. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you through the wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your heart having been enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So you can see here that there isn't like a like a straightforward disdain or displeasure of knowledge. Knowledge doesn't equal, it's not synonymous with death. <laughs> But there is a knowledge that you get from vision that is distinct from a knowledge you get from merely just knowing something is a, a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so what he's saying here is that the eyes of your heart having been enlightened. Jacob, did you know that your heart has eyes? Pretty weird, right? That you've never seen eyes on anyone's heart before. That wasn't in biology class. Well, the implication here, and there's a lot, there's a lot of verses that explain kind of what the heart really is um, that we can get into some other time. <clears throat> but essentially, the heart is the gateway to your, your soul. It's the gateway to your being. If your heart isn't turned to the Lord, nothing can get in. Um, and what this means is that your heart can be focused on something. If so, if your heart is focused on, and actually, there's, there's many verses about the heart. It's insane. Um, but the heart, the heart is deceitful. The heart loves various many things. And so in order to have a heart that sees what the Lord's purpose is, we have to have a heart that is the eyes of our heart is set on the Lord. Um, so that's what we turn is our heart. And actually, I mentioned this. If anyone saw the morning revival, Leslie, you saw it. You saw the morning revival. I saw you're on. Um, so what I shared with in my morning revival was 
when we have a time with the Lord, whether it's in our morning time or any time, really any time that we have an experience where we want to touch the Lord or we just want to pray or something like that in our personal time with the Lord, a good way to start off is to just say, Lord, I want to have a heart that's turned to you. I want to have a heart that's soft to you. I want to have a heart that's open to you. I don't want to have a heart that's set on so many other things. Lord, I'm saying this time to be with you. And so, Lord, I choose, even though I can't do it, I don't think I can do it myself. I choose to have a heart that's set on you right now. I want to have my, the eyes of my heart looking at you right now. And that's the only thing I want to care about. And I want to hear you. Whatever you do in this time, then let's do it. <laughs> um, but that's a, a, a great way to get into your spirit, touch the Lord, to see something of the Lord, mm -hmm. is to just start with that principle. Um, so then our last few verses here. I think Corinthians 3.16. Indeed, unto this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. But whenever their heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Mm -hmm. And the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all with unveiled face, beholding and reflecting like a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord Spirit. And you can go ahead and read Philippians 2.15. Philippians 2.15, that ye may be blameless and guileless, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine as luminaries in the world. Okay, so even these verses are like super, honestly, 2 Corinthians 3.15 through 18 should be like in our toolbox of verses that always, like there's always more that you can dig out of these verses, um, that you can see and appreciate from these verses, but um, 2 Corinthians 3.15, uh, basically it talks about how there's a veil that lies in our hearts. We are like the, the, we are like the people he's being talk, that are being talked about right now. Um, if our heart isn't turned to the Lord, then when we come to the Lord, it's like we have that blindfold on us. We have something that's blocking us. Remember, it's revelation. It's the removal of the veil. Mm -hmm. um, when we turn our heart, that's what this verse says. When we turn our heart to the Lord, the veil is taken away. It's automatic. In spirit, it happens automatically. And we can even, you know, if, if this seems like it's a hard thing to believe that it's actually happening, we can like just proclaim this to the Lord. Like we can hold the Lord to his own word. Lord, your word says mm -hmm. that when my heart turns to you, the veil is taken away. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to do right now, Lord. You know, the Lord will never be, the Lord will never be mad that you are intentionally and intensely trying to see him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the Lord is never going to be like, well, you really, you're trying to see me again really what is this the 10th time today it must be finals week you know what I mean? that's not that's not the way the lord is the lord is like like yes someone the, someone wants to look at me someone wants to have a heart that's turned to me and when you speak to the lord in this way you're like lord your word says i just according to your word i want to have a heart that's turned to you um and so anyway the result of this is actually when we behold the lord the result is that we reflect like a mirror. That's what this verse is saying. And so have you ever wondered how it is that you can be, um, that you can be a an example to your family, you know, in being a Christian, or maybe you have a friend who they have very negative opinions about Christians. Mm -hmm. um, and you're like, well, I don't know what I should do. Like, is there something good I should say to them? Mm -hmm. Is there some, is there something I should do? Well, actually, according to this verse, you are a mirror. Mm -hmm. And when you behold the Lord automatically, when your heart is turned and you're beholding the Lord, you are reflecting the Lord. So what they see is Christ in you being reflected. You are shining. And that's where this verse in Philippians comes from. Um, whom you shine as luminaries. This crooked and perverted generation. Basically, the world is dark. Um, and when you are beholding the Lord and you're reflecting the Lord, it actually says that you are shining as a luminary. Um, and if you ever want to see some cool stuff, look at the history of what the moon represents in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. But there's not time. True. Sorry, guys. There's not enough time to get into the matter of the moon, but very cool. Um, so anyway, I think that's good for now. So we've got our discussion questions, which you too can do in some manner. <laughs> <laughs>